Hi, welcome to my channel, Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. And today I'll be tackling another interesting clinical finding in cardiology. So today's video is on the fourth heart sound, which is S4, and we'll be talking about its mechanisms. Further details about how exactly to auscultate for an S4 will be dealt with in another video. So as always, let's mind map today's video. We're going to be talking about S4, which falls under clinical examination, which is subdivided into these various parts. And we're going to talk about auscultation. And this is our topic of concern today, which is S4. So I've come up with around a dozen questions here regarding today's video. So I'd request you again, as usual, to go through these questions, try to answer them, and then we'll go through them one by one. So define S4. Now, S4 is a low frequency sound which follows left atrial contraction. So in a way, it is what is what we call an atrial gallop. However, it is not really an atrial sound. Why is that? Because it's actually a ventricular origin sound. What happens is when there is a very fast and forceful atrial contraction, there is a lot of blood which enters the left ventricle in the end of diastole. So there is, as a result, audible vibrations which are set up because of sudden tensing of the LV mass, the mitral valve apparatus, and the blood itself within the ventricle. Right? So this is, you see, an S4 uh, diagrammatically. So this is the phonocardiogram, which is essentially showing all the four heart sounds. So S1 and S2, these define the systole, which is here in the center. This is a carotid tracing, arterial tracing. And this is the apex cardiogram, which shows the early apex impulse, which is which is felt rather on palpation in the early part of systole, after which the apex falls away. And when you see here, the early part of diastole is uh, is called as filling waves. This is the rapid filling wave and the slow filling waves. You can uh, see the details of this in my video on the apical impulse. And towards the latter part of diastole, we have the a wave and this corresponds to the fourth heart sound and this fourth heart sound is heard on auscultation when the a wave over here becomes prominent so this is felt even on palpation which will be dealt with in the video on uh, abnormal uh, apical impulses but the corresponding heart sound that you hear is the s4 and as you can see here uh, important point to note is that the S4 is quite loyal to the first heart sound. On the other hand, the S3, which occurs in the early part of diastole, if it does occur due to various abnormalities, it is quite loyal to S2. And this is an important distinction to differentiate the two sounds. So anyway, here you have a prominent S4, which occurs because of a very prominent atrial contraction. What is the normal LA booster pump? Now, normally, the left atrial booster pump or the left atrial contraction contributes to 20% of the cardiac output. However, when you have instances where the distensibility of the left ventricle is decreased, which in other words means that the compliance of LV is decreased, then the left atrium increases its work output to as much as 30 to 40%. What hemodynamics contribute to the production of S4? Now, there are certain hemodynamic prerequisites which are required for the production of the fourth heart sound. Number one is that the left ventricular dimension should be normal. If you look at pure causes of left uh, ventricular S4, there should not be any dilatation of the left ventricle. Second, the early and the mid LV diastolic pressures are normal. So what does this mean? Now, if you look at the graphs here, this is the left ventricular pressure tracing in black, and this is the left atrial pressure tracing in blue. And we know that this is the V wave and this is the A wave, which corresponds to the left atrial contraction. Now, the pressure of the left ventricle can be checked at different points of this pressure tracing. 
now when you have s4 it requires that the early part of the diastole this is the entire phase of diastole of the left ventricle the early part of the left ventricular diastole pressure tracing should be normal so this early and mid lv diastolic pressures are to be normal however the end diastolic pressure is raised and what is defined as end diastolic pressure is the pressure point on the left ventricular pressure tracing which occurs after the a wave that is after the left atrium contracts the pressure point on the lv is the lv edp so the hemodynamic prerequisites to get this s4 is normal early part of the diastole early as well as mid but the end diastolic pressure of the lv is raised and there are certain cutoffs different books say different cutoffs but generally if the lv edp is more than 16 mm of mercury and when it comes comes to its counterpart the right side the rv edp is to be more than 12 mm of mercury now what leads to this raised lv or rv edp anything which com co which compromises the compliance of these ventricles and the causes can be manifold there can be hypertrophy ischemia infarction fibrosis infiltrates so all these reasons lead to decrease in the compliance or decrease in the distensibility of that ventricle and as a result the lv edp or the rv edp rises but the early part and the mid part of the diastolic pressures in the lv pressure tracing remains the same or it basically remains normal and another hemodynamic uh, prerequisite for getting an s4 is that the cardiac output overall of the ventricle should be preserved so here you can see is this is a normal tracing of lv and uh, la however when there is an increase in the lv edp here you can see that the initial lv e wave now this is the e wave which corresponds to the early filling in early diastole because of relaxation this gets compromised so this e wave is much smaller as compared to the e wave of a normal tracing later on in order to comprom in order to compensate for this decrease in relaxation of this lv which is having low compliance the a wave comes into action and it contracts vigorously as a result the a wave is seen as a prominent waveform on this lv end diastolic pressure tracing and as a result you get this point at the end which is a raised lv edp which will be more than 16 mm of mercury and this will contribute to the production of a fourth heart sound what are the other prerequisites to the production of s4 in addition to the hemodynamic prerequisites that we've already seen so apart from the reduced lv compliance or the reduced distensibility and the non dilated lv there are other factors also number one is that the atrium should be healthy that is the la should be healthy it should have its uh, its ability to contract it the contractile ability of the la should be preserved so that also goes to mean that the patient should be in regular sinus rhythm because if the patient was for example in atrial fibrillation the atrium will not be able to contract and there is if there is no vigorous contraction of the la you will not get an s4 on clinical examination and the most important prerequisite is that there should not be any atrioventricular valve obstruction so there should not be a mitral stenosis on the left side or tricuspid stenosis on the right side otherwise there will not be a transmission of this high contractile forceful la pressure in the lv to towards the end diastole what are the various causes of left sided s4 or left sided fourth heart sound now the common denominator for all the causes is that there has to be a raised left ventricular end diastolic pressure caused due to low compliance or low distensibility of that ventricle so the common causes are coronary artery disease hypertension aortic stenosis hypertrophic cardiomyopathy either obstructed or non obstructed restrictive cardiomyopathy and any acute regurgitant lesions like acute mitral regurgitation or acute aortic regurgitation coming to the right side 
what causes right ventricular S4 or RVS4. All those conditions which lead to right ventricular pressure overload are responsible for an RVS4. For example, there's pulmonary hypertension, there's pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary embolism. Now to note, when you have a suspected pulmonary stenosis and if RVS4 is heard, it indicates that the septum is intact. If the septum was not intact and if there was a presence of a ventricular septal defect, then the pressure there would get decompressed through the VSD and you will not be able to get an RVS4. When is S4 audible in patients with acute myocardial infarction? Now we know that coronary artery disease is one of the commonest causes for an audible fourth heart sound. So in acute myocardial infarction, it is in fact heard in around 80 to 90% of patients. However, this S4 is heard one to two days after the presentation. It usually appears with angina and disappears on rest or nitroglycerin. The presence of S4 indicates that 10% of the myocardium is at jeopardy or it is at risk of being lost. What is the significance of S4 in aortic stenosis? Now, essentially, the presence of S4 means that the left ventricle to aortic gradient is quite significant. At least 50 millimeters of mercury is the gradient and some references mention at least 70 millimeters of mercury. Regardless, aortic stenosis is more than mild or more than moderate when you have an audible S4. Now, this S4 in case of aortic stenosis is heard more commonly in the young and not in the elderly. Why is that? Because the young patients have a preserved LA function. On the other hand, elderly patients usually suffer from atrial arrhythmias or they have associated sinus node dysfunction as a result of which the A wave is not seen and you do not get an S4. Can S4 be absent in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And the answer is no. You've got to always have S4 in HCM. And it doesn't matter what kind of HCM it is. It could either be an obstructive HCM or a non-obstructive HCM. There has got to be an audible S4 in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. An important question is, does this fourth heart sound persist when LV dysfunction sets in? Now, we know for sure that when we have low LV compliance and a normal LV function, we have evidence of a raised LVDP, as we've already seen, and this contributes to an S4. Now, what happens when the LV starts failing or what happens when the diastolic dysfunction starts becoming more severe? The early and the mid part of the ventricular diastolic pressure also starts rising when these situations take place. As a result of which the S4, which means to say that is the left atrial contraction, does not contribute much to the LV filling in LV dysfunction or severe grades of diastolic dysfunction. So the S4 becomes soft or inaudible. But the overall LA pressure becomes higher as we can see here that the early and the mid part of the diastole has also risen and the overall LA pressure has also gone up as compared to the previous waveforms. As a result, the early part of the LV diastolic pressure rises which contributes to an audible S3. So when you have LV dysfunction or severe grades of diastolic dysfunction, S4 virtually becomes soft or inaudible and then S3 starts to predominate. What are the clinical implications of S4 as compared to S3? I'll be having a separate video of S3. However, just to compare and contrast the two heart sounds, I brought in this question. So essentially, the fourth heart sound or S4 indicates decreased LV compliance and S3, on the other hand, indicates cardiac decompensation or the evidence of incipient or overt congestive heart failure. And overall, S3 is bad news. It indicates poor long-term outlook. Essentially, S4 is more benign than S3. Is S4 heard in acute or chronic MR? 
Now we know that S4 is heard in acute regurgitant lesions, but the difference between acute and chronic MR are explained here. Now what happens in chronic mitral regurgitation is that the left atrium is large and distensible, but the atrial contractile force is diminished and the patient may or may not have atrial fibrillation. Additionally, the LV may be dilated if the MR is chronic for a very long time and if it starts becoming decompensated then the LV also starts dilating. Also if it's a rheumatic cause of MR they, there may also be associated mitral stenosis. So all these reasons are responsible for no evidence of S4 in chronic MR. Now what happens in acute mitral regurgitation is that the left atrium is normal in size and its contraction is preserved. When there is a sudden rise in LVDP as well as LA pressure because of acute MR which can occur because of a caudal rupture or a papillary muscle necrosis or whatever reason it may be, it leads to a stretch in the left atrium. Now that leads to an effect on the LA which is sort of like a stalling effect that is more stretch leads to more contraction within physiological limits and as a result the left atrium contracts vigorously and it gives rise to a large S4. So does this mean that S4 is the lesser evil? Well, yes, at least it is better than S3. If S4 begins to disappear, then the situation is worse than before. I hope you like this video and please do like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon. And I'll see you next time with another video.